Pilkington and I spent a lot of time together. Of course, Mark was the uh, producer and, and one of the writers of the Mirage Men book and movie. He was probably the least popular speaker. Uh, you know, I've never seen Stanton Friedman get up, line up uh, at an audience mic to ask a presenter questions. And boy, he was he was <laughs> raring to go. Of course, Mark was quite controversial with his comment that every single crop circle ever made uh, was made by humans. Uh, a lot of people took exception to that. He, he, even I did. I think all in all, it was a great, uh, it was a really good Congress. I, I think they're improving every year. You know, I really hope that they continue in this direction. One thing I'm going to suggest is trying to get younger people involved, maybe uh, have a student rate for young people to come, uh, to be able to afford to come. And also maybe do some streaming, uh, stream the conference, uh, maybe for a, a nominal fee. Go ahead. They have professional videographers videotaping the whole thing. All you need is a switcher and an internet connection, and you could be streaming the uh, the conference. So I think that that would open it up for young people, which I think is important. All in all, I think it was really good. Now, just to point out here in terms of location, this was held in the Fountain Hills area, but Arizona State University is about a 20-minute drive away. We're talking about tens of thousands of young people. And if there was a way to attract that audience, we would reach a new generation yeah. of people who are apt to be interested in what's going on. They're concerned about the environment. They're concerned about war. They're concerned about a lot of things, and certainly all these strange things that are happening they ought to be concerned about it, and I think they would if they were given the opportunity. Now, I was just thinking as you were talking about that reporter from the Arizona Republic. Now, let me have a few disclaimers here. I used to be a columnist for the Arizona Republic and for another newspaper in the Gannett chain, USA Today. My son was an intern and later actually received a paycheck for a couple of years writing for the Arizona Republic. So we have an affinity for that place. But what seems to have happened here is the reporter went to the concession stands, the vendor's booths, a separate room from the actual conference speakers, looked around, found the wackiest stuff, and decided to write a story. That's lazy reporting. That's going in there and sitting for an hour, grabbing a couple of quick interviews because Stanton Friedman was quoted because he was there in the vendor area for quite a while. And that's it. That's the story. It's not who spoke at the event. It's the photograph of alleged alien implants. Again, I really do think it's um, it behooves a reporter to actually do his job and, and go in and and do a you know well grounded, well rounded piece on an event such as this. It's just a, a never ending source of irritation for me when I look at how uh, mainstream media still is uh, you know ten, tending to cover these these subjects. And as far as the the actual conference itself, you know, having people come from out of town, paying lots of money to, to stay in a hotel, pay money to, you know, put a butt in the chair, so to speak. I don't think that this particular way of relaying information is, is, is going to be viable for much longer. The average age in that room, uh, in that conference room, had to have been 60 or, or older. Uh, there's no way that kids are going to be attracted to this type of, of event. I think something online, something streaming, something more high tech is going to uh, be the best approach to try to get a younger audience and, and a younger crowd interested in these subjects. I think we're seeing this this crossover time period where, you know, the older generation from the 50s and 60s and 70s now are, are, are going to be passing the baton along. And we've got to figure out a, you know, an efficacious way to do this and, and really keep this this ball moving forward and keep the interest up and and keep people motivated and i think by utilizing uh, mobile phone technology uh, internet streaming um, these sorts of approaches i think are going to be a go a long way to attract uh, younger people to this subject well if they had a live stream it might have helped remember as far as young people are concerned over at asu we're still in the middle of a semester over there so they'd only get there on the weekends maybe they have to study but if this thing was streamed online they could watch at least the evening proceedings from their dorm rooms and right. if it's done at a modest fee you know enough to cover expenses and we don't begrudge anybody earning a profit from what they do but charge a fair price it might have worked pretty well in yeah. any case we look forward to next year but i have one more question to ask you before we go on to our guest this week bob lazar anything new there no you know i just thought it was <laughs> it was interesting uh, but we basically heard 
essentially the same story again, uh, told with a little bit more humor uh, at moments. And, you know, it was, I think he was there as uh, more of as a draw. I didn't really um, sit through his presentation. I've, I pretty much um, was clued in exactly what was going to be happening. So it, it, it didn't really, uh, I think, I think a lot of people walked away kind of scratching their heads, wondering why, why he was even there. Because I, I from what I understand, there was no new information imparted uh, by Lazar. And, uh, you know, I think it, he's kind of a, a, a bit of a you know water under the bridge at this point. I'd like to see somebody else from uh, S4, or from from uh, Area 51, or some somewhere out on the on the test range there, come forward and and become our new Bob Lazar, and and you know maybe spill some uh, spill some beans out there that we can sink our teeth into and learn something more. In 20 seconds or less, tell us about our guest this week. Well, David uh, Childress is quite the. Uh, Amazing world traveler. He's written dozens of books. Many people question his um, suspension of disbelief and, and his contention uh, that um, ancient aliens are responsible for megalithic sites found around the world that can't be explained by science. I don't care who, you know, who you are. We can't even lift thousand ton blocks of stone, uh, raise huge obelisks. David has been a champion of diffusionist archaeology for many years. He thinks the oceans were highways, not barriers. So it's going to be an interesting uh, wild ride with David Hatcher Childers. With Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I had already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TECHNIGHTOWL for a special discount. Have you ever felt like the United States government knows way too much about your financial affairs? I continue to hear stories about property seizures, frozen bank accounts, confiscation of stocks and bonds. It makes me wonder if the U.S. citizen will ever again have the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Unfortunately, with the Drug and Money Laundering Act, the IRS Revenue Ruling 6045 of 1984, and the Trading with the Enemy Act and Franklin D. Roosevelt's Executive Order of 1933, some precious metal holdings are subject to government intervention. For this reason, Midas Resources has prepared a report explaining the boundaries of trading precious metals privately. Whether if you have any intention of trading with Midas Resources or not, I have instructed my representatives to give this report out free. Call for your free copy at 1-800-686-2237. When investing, always proceed with caution. Again, call 1-800-686-2237. Exercise your legal right to trade metals privately. 1-800-686-2237. You pick up the receiver with your heart racing and sweat dripping from your forehead. You finally muster the courage to dial the number to call into your favorite talk radio show. It rings once, twice, and then... Hello, it's GCN. What's your name and the state you're calling from? Surprised you got through, you squeak out. Jason from Minnesota. Please hold. As you patiently wait for your turn, you begin to daydream about being a famous talk radio host and what it would be like to have your own show. Jason from Minnesota, you're up. Millions of loyal listeners worldwide waiting to call and talk to you. Caller, are you there? Cheering crowds surround you, calling out your name. Going once, twice. Okay, we gotta move on to the next caller. You blew it. Huh? Wait, no! Interact with the host you're listening to right now online at GCNlive.com. Click on the community link. Engage with other listeners. Ask questions. Start debates. Don't agree with the host? Let them know. Be a part of the community at GCNlive.com. Extend your life with Extendovite. Here is what one doctor has to say about Extendovite. 
I would like to thank you, Don, for making my job so much easier because your products just make it so simple, right? To fool around with a lot of exotic things that don't work. We can just put them on your product and things start to work almost right away. I've had dozens and dozens of patients with uh, heart problems who have corrected them. And what it's doing, there's so much garlic in there that has a yeast killing effect. The yeast is a big problem in the gut, pushes the liver heart. It also has metal chelating effect. And most of the other herbs in there I find that strengthen the arteries. They help to neutralize free radicals. Your remedy is close to what we do in our program as you can get as far as one supplement goes. It's working on the, the gut, it's working on the liver, it's working on the arteries. What more can you ask for? To get your Extendivite, call 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. After about a four-year absence, we welcome back David Hatcher Childress. Of course, we know him from... His publishing company, Adventures Unlimited Press, which has zillions of books. Did I say zillions? And of course, he's been very much involved in what he calls diffusionist archaeology. And I have no idea what that means, and he'll explain it to us. David, welcome back to the show. And I think for those who haven't heard your earlier appearances, maybe spend a few moments telling us about your background. What attracted you to any kind of archaeology? And how did you come to focus on such things as ancient astronauts? Well, I, you know, I've always been interested in travel and archaeology and history. I, my parents are Americans, but I was actually born in France in the late, late 50s. And so my parents like to travel a lot. And so I was, I was fortunate as a young kid to, to travel in, in Europe and Mexico and Pacific Islands. Uh, we went to, to Turkey and, and Greece and got to see things like Stonehenge when I was younger. And my father uh, was also a real outdoorsy guy and loved to camp and hike. And I basically grew up in, in the mountains of Colorado as a mountain climber and backpacker and, and skier and stuff. But eventually, uh, I, I think, you know, like so many people and, and many of your listeners, just uh, grew up on a steady dose of Johnny Quest cartoons and Kung Fu episodes and Man from Uncle and the Time Tunnel and all that kind of stuff. And, and so I'm very interested always in um, ESP and, and Atlantis, Bigfoot, um, UFOs and whatnot. And uh, people from my generation, too, uh, as you'll remember, Gene, uh, watching Neil Armstrong land on the moon and all that. It was all, it was all so exciting back then and just a kind of a normal upbringing in that way. But I was lucky. I got to travel uh, when I was younger. I, I graduated from the University of Montana, and I just took to the road when I was still 18, 19, and went to, uh, I went to the Far East, actually, as an English teacher and lived in Taiwan and uh, ultimately in, in Hong Kong and then later in, in Thailand and traveled through, through India and went to Nepal and went climbing in the Himalayas. I'd always been interested, of course, in, in yetis and also in mountain climbing and going to Tibet and Tibetan monasteries and things like that. And, and I was able to do all that. Uh, later traveled across the Middle East and even through Afghanistan and Iran and, and Pakistan and, and uh, Turkey and Syria to, to Jordan and then to Israel. Later to uh, Greece again and, and Egypt, went to the Great Pyramid, wanted to see all the Egyptian stuff. And then I traveled for almost three years in, in Africa. And was, I worked with a catering company that um, that was catering to Chevron Oil in, in Sudan at the time. And then suddenly I went from being just a $3 a day backpacker to actually having some money in the bank. And that, that allowed me to travel even more. And I returned across the Indian Ocean, went back to India and Nepal and Sri Lanka that time, and, and, and again back to China. And, and then I returned to the U.S. finally in the early 80s, and, and then I began traveling in uh, South America and Central America and, and the Pacific Islands and places like that. And I've kept going all these years. Uh, finally, I started writing books in the middle 80s, and uh, my first book was a book called A Hitchhiker's Guide to Africa and Arabia. 
And then later I began writing uh, my Lost Cities series, which are regional. There's, there's one on on uh, China, Central Asia, India, one on one on South America, one on North and Central America, one on African Arabia, one on uh, Europe and the Mediterranean and, and other areas too. So that got me going and uh, eventually, I, once I started writing books, I was being published in Chicago, but my publisher one day kind of sat me down and told me not to quit my day job and and told me it was actually publishers that, you know, make the money rather than authors. And at that point, I thought, well, hey, I'll be a publisher then. And so I started with Adventures Unlimited Press and ultimately a magazine called World Explorer Magazine. And uh, that's what I do today. And I somehow make a living at all that, publishing books and magazines and, and writing books as well. And uh, that's great. And that, now there's the Ancient Aliens TV show with... Giorgio and Eric Vandonikin and all those guys, and, uh, and I get to be on that, and it's it's a real uh, pleasure and privilege, you know, to, to be part of all that, I've, and I enjoy it. So it's, here I am today, I'm no looking back, I guess. Okay, let's look back at something else here, ancient astronauts. Now, the concept of ancient astronauts is nothing new to people who follow UFOs and other literature. There were writings about it even in the early 50s, of course, if you remember the contactee George Adamski in his book, Flying Saucers Have Landed, the first part of the book, written by Desmond Leslie, a British researcher, was about ancient astronauts. There was also a fellow named Yona Fortner who had the concept of extraterrestrialism, which he referred to as the presence of advanced aliens in our past, and he wrote for Jim Mosley's Saucer News, a wild character. In fact, before we go on, did you ever meet Yona at all? Uh, no, no, I never did. Oh, he's no longer with us, but he was a first-rate character. But okay, let's get to the main focus here of a lot of what you're doing. The possibility of the presence of advanced beings in our past. So, to be blunt about it, David Hatcher Childress was God an E.T.? <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, I, of course, that's a, you know, a simple question, but I, I don't really have a simple answer for it. I'm not so sure that God's an E.T., but perhaps angels are E.T.s, and certainly God's helpers are, can be E.T.s, I think, and it's more of a, I guess, in a way, I would say that, uh, I mean, I'm a spiritual person, so I, I believe in spirituality and um, higher beings, and uh, I do believe in, um, oh, uh, sort of helper beings who are, who are here to assist us, even like the, um, you know, the light beings that come during death experiences and stuff like that. But a lot of the stories in the Bible uh, and other ancient texts do talk about uh, Yahweh uh, as as a, as a god, and, and Yahweh, this vengeful god who, like with Moses in the Ark of the Covenant, you know, he appears in a pillar of light in a cloud, and he follows them. He he actually incinerates people uh, through through the Ark of the Covenant, and um, in, in fact, my new book that that I'm working on now is is a book about the Ark of the Covenant and and ancient powers like that, and. I mean, that's one of the things that happens in in uh, in Exodus, where supposedly God tells Moses to build this Ark of the Covenant, which is a, basically a box of of wood and metal, and then this special statue is to be built and placed on top of it of these two cherubim, two angels who are facing each other, and they're they're holding like a bowl between them, and, and this light appears in the bowl, and, and that is, that's God, that's Yahweh, supposedly, and Yahweh tells Moses all kinds of stuff, and, and even this Ark of the Covenant, according to the Bible, flies ahead of them, uh, it, it's a, uh, they have to carry it in certain ways, they, they cover it. David Hatcher Childress, discussing ancient astronauts and more, with Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. Free from the shackles of corporate America, we're the place for independent thinkers. G-C-N. Is there a secret UFO agenda? 
Do strange creatures from the darkest corners of the mind roam the earth? Is there evidence for mind control, time travel, or devious government conspiracies? Find out the inside scoop on the latest conspiracies, paranormal activity, and Freudian phenomena when you subscribe to Tim Beckley's Conspiracy Journal. It's jam-packed with stories, special book and DVD promotions, and the best news, it's absolutely free, sent right to your mailbox. Plus, a bonus free email newsletter sent out every Friday. Simply send an email with your name and address to Mr. UFO at webtv.net. That's Mr. UFO at webtv.net. Find out what they don't want you to know. Attention listeners, SurvivalLife.com is giving away free Everstrike permanent matches for a limited time only. These matches are waterproof and will light in any weather condition, rain, snow, or sleet. It will still throw a spark. Its built-in ferro rod strikes at 3,000 degrees, and it is good for 15,000 strikes. Normally, $15. Today, it's free. Get yours at FreeSurvivalLighter.com. Again, that's FreeSurvivalLighter.com. Hurry, supplies are limited. Visit FreeSurvivalLighter.com today. By now, you heard about Bitcoins. But did you know that over 65,000 businesses accept Bitcoins? Listen, if you're already earning Bitcoins or trying to make money in the Bitcoin market, you've got to know BidBit.co. Because at BidBit.co, you can receive Bitcoin by selling your personal items or business products. You heard right. Whether personal or business, you can now buy, sell, and auction your products quickly, easily, and securely at BidBit.co. That's B-I-D. B-I-T dot C-O. BidBit.co. What good? is a Big Berkey water filter? We get that question a lot here at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com and in a word, the answer is protection. Protection from water main breaks, E. coli contamination, environmental chemical spills, pesticide runoff, chlorine taste and smell, and all forms of fluoride. Plus, Big Berkey water filters are the original gravity water filter system and most trusted on the market for a reason. Tested by multiple independent NSF EPA certified labs, they are the gold standard in water purification. At only 1.7 cents a gallon, a single set of filters can last for 5 to 10 years. That means big savings. Big Berkey, the one that's powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water. Get a Big Berkey today at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit our website or call 1-877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-BERKEY. Big Berkey Water Filters, for the love of clean water. Did you know that drinking pure, high alkaline water is one of the most important factors in maintaining high energy and vibrant health? Most experts agree that the water you drink should be at a pH level of 8 or higher. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops, available only at AlkaVision.com, combine a unique formula of only the most alkaline minerals. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops alkalize your water, ridding the body of harmful toxins, and helps you regain health and energy. Alkalizing your water by simply adding 10 drops of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops helps Helps the body rid itself of acidic waste, increases oxygen content, and raises the pH of your body to healthy levels. And bacteria and viruses cannot survive in an alkaline high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH drops for only $29.95 at AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776. Alkalize your body. Supercharge your health at AlkaVision.com today. This is Robert Hastings, author of UFOs and Nukes, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. David Hatcher Childress is with us, and he has written in a number of books, some of which focus on the possibility of ancient astronauts, that advanced aliens visited us a couple of thousand years ago and made a huge impact. Now, there are so many facets of this we can cover. So let's get to the nuts and bolts here, David. And that is, if you're talking to somebody who says, how do we know this happened? Are there a few pieces of smoking gun evidence that you can cite to say, this shows we've been visited by advanced beings a thousand or two thousand years or longer ago? Well, 
For me, uh, largely um, archaeological evidence, and I really uh, work mainly as an archaeologist, so I'm constantly traveling all over the world and looking mainly at, at megalithic ruins and, and things that are especially well-made, large, um, mysterious, in, in that sense of, of giant blocks that are, that are quarried and they're found all over the world. You put those in context with myths and legends, um, the various stories, and I'm, you know, I'm often very impressed by things that I see. Other places are rather disappointing in some cases, sometimes. But when you put those things in context, particularly very, very large megalithic ruins, things like Tiwanaku and in Bolivia and uh, many other ruins that are um, typically ascribed to the Incas, which were very near to us. And you you see how people who are supposedly primitive, and in, in the case of like the Incas, um, uh, they allegedly didn't know about the wheel or they didn't have iron tools, they didn't have writing either. And yet they supposedly built structures that we couldn't even really build today and they're they're articulated and and in in many cases such as at at, at Tiwanaku or Puma Punku or something I mean they're so well built and kind of uh, there's a lot of fancy articulation that's gone on there yet it's supposedly done by people who are bashing out ruins in with with rock hammers in their hands and you, you look at a lot of that, those things, and particularly if you just look at them open-mindedly, they're not easily explained. And the idea that primitive, simple people are making this, and, and in many cases the archaeologists just have it wrong because they're actually asc- ascribing the, the origin of these ruins to somebody who probably didn't even build them. So there you go with, with things that are, are, are quite tangible. And that's, I mean, that's the good part about, um, I think, the archaeology and the megalithic ruins is that they're there for people to see. In some cases, you have to actually go underwater to see some of them. The giant ruins at, at Dan Madal in the Pacific, I mean, that place is like the eighth wonder of the world. There's over 250 million tons of basalt are stacked up, not even on the island of, of Ponte, which is in Micronesia. And, it's relatively close to uh, New Guinea, actually. But uh, this 250 million tons of basalt, they're stacked up in, in walls and, and artificial islands and in the ocean. They're, that giant city is, is not even built really on land. Uh, yet most of it is above water because they've created artificial islands and things like that. But much of it's underwater. And the stones there weigh um, up to 80 tons is the largest ones. And once again, you have um, the, the people there uh, are said to have not had any metal tools. Um, How did they, they think they got them out there from the from the quarry site? Did, with outrigger canoes or something? I mean, what do, what do conventional archaeologists, uh, what's their explanation? I mean, how... how how do they explain this? Well, that is that is their explanation that they brought them on outrigger canoes and things, and and as far as that goes, they they don't know blocks. where. <laughs> yeah, they don't know where the quarry site is. Uh, entire mountains would be dismantled. Um, it's it's you know it's prismatic basalt that's at Namadal, and it's and so it it it's like um, the. Giant's Causeway in Northern Ireland, or this, 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 this or, or, or other hardest, hardest stones known to science. Yeah, and it, and and there's certain formations of basalt that uh, that they they crystallize in 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 really um, kind of bluffs and and cliffs, and the prismatic basalt is there to to separate if if you can do that. Um, in places, um, I mean, there's there's a number of places where you can see prismatic basalt, but Namadal is one of the few places where prismatic basalt has, it, it, and in in there it, it's in a huge amount. I mean, it's 250 million tons of it. It's separated into these various sizes of of 
kind of they look like eight sided uh, Lincoln logs or something. Only they're extremely heavy and and hard. Uh, basalt's magnetic too, but they can't even. There's so much of the basalt there that entire mountains would have been uh, disassembled in order to create the material. And they don't know where it came from. Um, it, it, it baffles the archaeologists, too. There's so much. But wherever it came from, it, it's, it's thought that it, it was then put into outrigger canoes. A 20-ton, a, 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 a 50-ton giant block of basalt. And then somehow floated uh, around the island and then dumped onto this coral reef and in some cases piled up into 30, 40 foot high walls and things. And and even why they would do it. The natives say there that the the basalt was flown through the air and magically flown through the air and two brothers uh, built the city. They had a flying dragon supposedly. And when you go there, I mean, it's amazing. Um, the islanders don't like even going to the city. They they have a, a certain fear of it, and they believe that they'll die if they spend the night there. There's lights that move around the city at night, probably because of the, the just the magnetic um, presence of, of all the basalt, and it somehow creates some kind of mysterious sort of what, ball piezo, lightning or something. Piezo, piezoelectric uh, discharges or something? something? Yeah, something like that. And just uh, certain a- atmospheric conditions make lights move around uh, through the city. This is what they people see at night. Who well, kind well, of well, this, 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 this particular site kind of brings up what quite a number of people uh, have asked on our forums at forum.theparacast.com where our listeners get get to ask our guests questions. And there's a number of questions that, that kind of are, are interested in finding out your thoughts about the possibility of some sort of ancient human civilization uh, millions of years ago, possibly even, that, that, that may have existed that is not acknowledged by, by modern archaeology that may somehow be responsible for some of these sites that were then inherited by the current or, you know, fairly recent uh, residents of these areas. Do you, do you think that there's a possibility that we may be seeing the uh, the vestiges of some prior uh, civilization that's now gone? I'll tell you what, David, let's hold that answer for a moment. I just want to remind our listeners that we have a place we'd like you to go. It's plus.theparacast.com, P-L-U-S dot theparacast.com. And that's where you can learn about the Paracast Plus, where we offer a higher quality audio version of the show with 41 minutes of network ads removed. Also, the exclusive After the Paracast podcast. And you can get it for as low as $5 a month. And we have annual or five year subscriptions. If you order a one year or five year subscription, our own Chris O'Brien has arranged to get you a copy of the ebook version of Stalking the Tricksters, plus.theparacast.com. And right now we're talking to David Hatcher Childress. He has a long question to answer about older, advanced civilizations on Earth. With Gene and Chris, you're in. The Paracast. A little right, a little left, but always independent-minded. The Genesis Communications Network, GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a -a thrill-a-minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors, classic science fiction at its best, available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S dot com.
If the IRS has garnished your paycheck or seized money from your bank account, you need to get professional tax help now. Fast action is required to put a halt to these aggressive IRS collection tactics. You can count on the knowledgeable team of tax professionals at Wall & Associates. With over 30 years of experience, Wall & Associates has settled the tax problems of thousands of taxpayers for a small fraction of what they owed. For a free face-to-face -face consultation, call 1-800-425-4610 to put a wall between you and the IRS. 1-800-425-4610 or look for us on the web at wallandassociates.net. We solve tax problems. If you hire Walland Associates today, you'll never have to talk to the IRS again. To stop the levies and seizures today, take action now. Call Walland Associates at 1-800-425-4610. Wall and Associates. 1-800-425-4610. Based on actual cases, results may vary. Not a solicitation for legal services. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation. You control what you watch when you watch it. Record your favorite shows, pause and rewind live TV, even skip the commercials. Watch local channels too. At just $19.99, what are you waiting for? Pull out your major credit or debit card. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. 1-855-905-MY-TV. Say goodbye to the cable guy. Cut costs and get more. 1-855-905-MY-TV. 1-855-905-MY-TV. This alert just came in. This special announcement is for business owners and leaders of organizations who've been waiting for the right time to build. General Steel has made it impossible to wait any longer with rock-bottom prices that could save you thousands. That's right, General Steel, America's leader in pre-engineered structures, is offering buildings at prices you will never see again. Don't miss these prices. A 50 by 100 for $35,000. You heard right, that's 5,000 square feet for $35,000. Manufacturers, if you need a larger building, try a 100 by 100 commercial building for $129,000. You can't afford to rent with these prices. Imagine a 70 by 100 foot church building for under $69,000. With the economy improving and interest rates still at historic lows, you can't afford to wait. So call 866-91-STEEL. Lock in your price now. Call 866-91-STEEL. That's 866-917-8335. This is Jacques Vallée, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We have David Hatcher Childress, who, of course, has written many books, has Adventures Unlimited Press, with Gene and Chris on the Paracast. And he was asked a long question, based on several from our listeners, about advanced civilizations on Earth. And maybe we're seeing the remnants of them in some of these artifacts. David? Well, right. And I, I think that's a good point. With many of these cities um, or and ruins, whatever they are, uh, Namadal, uh, like Tiwanaku, a lot of what's in Peru, and described to the Incas, places like Baalbek, even uh, the Wailing Wall at Jerusalem. These ruins are, in some cases, they're so huge and so big. And it, it's essentially a, a base foundation, such as at Baalbek, where we have what are the the largest known uh, quarried blocks uh, weighing up to a uh, thousand tons, and even more with with some of the uh, so-called unfinished blocks there. And so, when you have ruins like this, uh, and Namadal totally fits into this, you have giant blocks of stone. They're they're weighing fifty, a hundred, two hundred, a thousand tons. And they're stacked up and into walls. Sometimes they're very carefully cut and placed. Um, with Namadal, they're actually the basalt is is rougher and and it's more just you know giant blocks put up and they're they're not carefully cut and placed. But when you have something like that, it's going to last for a long time. I mean, it's virtually indestructible. And 
as long as it's above water or in some place where people can actually live today and, and instead of on top of some remote mountain or something like that, then it's going to remain there. And, and a wandering tribe thousands of years after this has been made can come in and, and suddenly claim it for their own. Um, in the case of the Andes, I mean, that's really what's happened with places like Machu Picchu and, and Cusco and Texawaman or Ollante Tambo. People are literally living in ancient buildings that were already there. And all they had to do was put a, a roof on many of these buildings and and reoccupy them because they're megalithic and they're virtually indestructible. Um, the Spanish did try and rearrange some of the buildings. They would put in new windows or doors or something, and, and, and their construction was always... Um, uh, of a more poor quality than the original. Um, but so, because these buildings are essentially indestructible, they're occupied and reoccupied over generations, over literally hundreds and thousands of years. Jerusalem is a good example. What's, what's at the base of the Wailing Wall and what was originally Solomon's Temple is also a, a Baalbek type foundation of, of huge, uh, what are called ashlers, uh, giant stone foundation blocks that are the size of a railway car or something. And, and they're like at Baalbek, they're weighing at some astonishing amount of weight, something like 500 tons or something. And so if you're the roaming Israelites or, or the Incas or wherever you are, when you come along and you find what is essentially a, a giant wall that that's already there, you can't even dismantle it yourself. Although in many cases that is what happens to ruins; they're they're dismantled and used for building blocks themselves. And the, the Spanish did that so much in in Mexico and and South America, where they would dismantle other pyramids and Mayan or Aztec things, and and then would build other churches and things. That's easier to do when you have smaller blocks and, or bricks or something. And that's what happened to a lot of the ancient cities in India and, and Pakistan, the Indus Valley cities, which, which are made out of fired bricks. And they're very well made, but yet, you know, they're, they're not megalithic stones that are difficult to move, even though these bricks were thousands of years old. And in fact, the Indus Valley civilization is, is known to go back to uh, 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 B.C., and yet in the 1940s and 50s, they were dismantling these cities to to build uh, railway buildings, and they were building the railway through Pakistan at that time, so they, they used those bricks as ballast. So we have this reuse of, of ancient materials. Uh, sometimes, if, if it's possible, uh, uh, ancient city is, or structure is dismantled, but in other times, it, it's because it's megalithic, it can't be dismantled. And, and even modern archaeologists couldn't take these things apart. And now we want to preserve these things, fortunately. And so they become World Heritage Sites and things like that. But they're used and reused. And that causes a problem for archaeologists, too, because archaeologists make all kinds of kind of dumb and basic assumptions like, oh, well, uh, you know, um, if we go into this giant wall, if we find a piece of wood to date, uh, that will tell us when this wall was built. Uh, and, and then they go and they, they find somewhere in a little niche or cubby hole in the wall, they, they find a bone or they find a, a piece of wood, and, and that's something that can be uh, carbon dated. And then they'll, so they'll carbon date it, and they'll say, oh, well, this piece of wood is, is 500 years old. And so archaeologists and in their uh, infinite wisdom will say, that's when this wall was built, 500 years ago, because that's the date of this piece of wood. But you know, that's just an assumption. Uh, that piece of wood uh, could have been placed there 500 years ago by somebody who didn't build that wall, somebody who camped there for 20 years and uh, used to put all their bones and, and or even burials inside these walls. So the assumption that, that the person who put that piece of wood inside this wall is the builder is 
quite honestly, probably completely wrong. Okay, and- so let me just ask you here, so we kind of foreclose this. All right, so if taking the wood and carbon dating it is wrong, what should they be checking to check the age of the structure? Well, right. Uh, it's, it's not that easy to date this structure. If the structure itself has dates on it, then it, that would be fine. But you cannot date just a piece of a rock. Uh, even if it's been squared and quarried and, and placed there, there, we don't have any uh, dating technique that uh, at, at present that will tell us when that rock was was quarried. It's interesting that in that whole concept because uh, Graham Hancock mentions in his book, um, just as a footnote uh, in Fingerprints of the Gods, how the University of Wales back in the late 1980s had tried to devise a a technique uh, it was called chlorine 23 that would show when rock was quarried and cut from uh, from say a, a, a mountain quarry and removed uh, and they thought that they had this as as a accurate dating technique, but they went then to Stonehenge to use this dating technique on Stonehenge, and the the date that they came up with for the removal of the rock from the quarry was 20,000 years before present, and archaeologists wouldn't accept that. And so at, at that point, they, they said, well, this is just not accurate. This is a wrong dating technique, because... Stonehenge can't be that old. Yeah, but in light of Gobleki Tepe and, and other sites, uh, th- th- that's within within the realm of, of reason. I, well, I sure. Well, that's right. But it uh, but th- that would have made Stonehenge still ten thousand years older than Gobekli Tepe. At a site like Gobekli Tepe, and Gobek, I've been there. It, it Gobekli Tepe was um, was buried site. Uh, it was a they. The builders of it, or or somebody later, not necessarily the builders, decided to actually bury it, and and they created this what is a kind of artificial hill. It was already probably built up on top of hill, and then they buried it. But when, as they uncovered it today, and it's German and Turkish archaeologists really doing it, because they unburied it, you know, they were able to come again. They couldn't date the rock itself, and or and that, but they did come up with um, datable objects. Uh, pottery can also be tested as a, with, with a different technique. Um, but yeah, so they found those dates, uh, and and that was like carbon dating type stuff. And, and so there they came up with dates like 9000 BC and stuff, and, and they had to accept those dates. Um, even though they don't interpret the site, you know, uh, the way I would, they're saying there at Gobekli Tepe that that this is the earliest site. Uh, they don't think there are earlier um, megalithic sites than that, although no doubt there are. Let's go into but, more of this detail in our next segment with David Hatcher, Childress, and Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Independently leading the way for the nation. Compelling talk for every political persuasion. We are GCN. I'm really glad my buddy Mark turned me on to GunsAD.com. I got to tell you, I didn't want to buy any more firearms. I didn't want a paperwork trail headed back to Big Brother. I want 100% privacy. I want to be an invisible gun owner. Hello? So Mark says, hey, you know, GunsAD.com, Ghost AR-15. Ghost means invisible. Get it? Ghost AR-15. Guns80.com. I got a couple, if you know what I mean. Go to guns80.com or call 844-2-GUNS-80. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. Have you ever wondered why banks, stockbrokers, investment advisors won't talk about gold IRAs? They've been available since 1986, yet the financial industry won't recognize the value of gold for your retirement. Gold has outperformed paper investments, yet no word about IRAs. If you would like to have gold for your retirement, call 800-686-2237. Don't get left behind by rising inflation and low returns. Call 800-686-2237. Secure your future and call 1-800-686-2237. 
By now, you may have heard a bit about Bitcoins. But did you know Bitcoins are now over an $8.5 billion market? And did you know that over 65,000 businesses now accept Bitcoins? Listen, if you're already earning Bitcoins or trying to make money in the Bitcoin market, you've got to know BidBit.co. Why? Because BidBit.co is where you can easily receive Bitcoins by selling and auctioning off your own personal items or promote business products and services for Bitcoins. You heard right. Whether personal or business, you can now buy, sell, and auction your products and services quickly, easily, and securely for Bitcoin at BidBit.co, the first and only marketplace website to offer BidBit escrow, a proprietary technology which gives buyers and sellers security and peace of mind because all transactions are protected. Start today. It's free to join, free to post, free to auction, and free to bid at BidBit.co. Buy, sell, bid, or auction everything Bitcoin. That's www.bidbit.co. BidBit.co. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. Our guest is David Hatcher Childress, prolific author. Of course, the force behind Adventures Unlimited Press. We're talking about ancient artifacts or more ancient artifacts. And you were talking, by the way, and it's getting to be a long answer, but 9,000 BC. How far back can we trace any of these artifacts? Well, I think that going back around 10,000 BC is, is a pretty good date to, to go for. Uh, they don't tend to date stone structures much much older than that. There are some uh, buildings that were found in, in Poland and they were made out of uh, mammoth tusks and uh, mammoth bones. And they do date those structures to like 20,000 or even 30,000 BC. Uh, allegedly, they're the oldest structures that are known. The whole yeah. idea of how old humans are, how long humans have been making buildings and building roads and bridges and and boats and port cities and and things and, and going places it's a controversial subject and basically again with as you described me earlier as a diffusionist the, the two main schools of of anthropology are are isolationism versus diffusionism and isolationists are really the ones in charge of our universities and educational system in a sense right now and they tend to argue that ancient man was isolated he didn't really go places oceans are are barriers not not highways people just can't get into boats and, and cross oceans and go places they they have to walk everywhere and even this whole out of africa theory is is only that they're, they find ancient bones and things in Africa, and that's all fine. And then they they say, well, I mean, everybody just had to, you know, got up and walked out of Africa and, and went everywhere. But a lot of that is assuming that the the whole world looks exactly like it does today, and that the continents uh, look like they are, the oceans are where they are. What is underwater uh, today is underwater then, and what was what's dry land today was dry land then. Geologists would normally tell you that that's completely wrong. And uh, 10,000 years ago, ocean levels were 300 feet lower than they are today. And that would make areas in, like, just the central Pacific or central Indian Ocean or the central Atlantic. It would, it would turn small island groups into mini continents and things like that. Um, it's quite possible that ancient man uh, came from some area that's underwater right now, um, in the Pacific Ocean or in the Atlantic or, or off Africa or anywhere. I mean, we don't really know what it was like 50,000 years ago, but we can pretty much guess that it wasn't like it was today. Climates were different. There were giant animals running around then. Uh, the whole end of the Miocene with these with woolly rhinos and and woolly mammoths and huge Mega herds of them. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and, and they were all wiped out. And uh, I mean, there, there's things that we just 
can't even wrap our heads around. At the end of the last ice age, there were huge ice sheets right around Chicago. Uh, they call it the, the Wisconsin Glacial Shield. Yet, at that same time that there were huge glaciers around Chicago, there were he- giant herds of woolly mammoths and woolly rhinos and giant elk running around in Siberia and, and, and Alaska. And there wasn't glaciers up there. I mean, it, it, it doesn't even make sense. Um, geologists can't really explain it. How is it that the North Pole doesn't have all this ice, but the around Chicago, there is ice? Uh, what, you know, how does that make sense? And then all of these animals were wiped out in a huge tidal wave. Most of the uh, ivory that was used in the, in the late 1800s and, and uh, early 1900s for piano keys and billiard balls and all that it didn't come from African elephants. It came from piles of ivory in Siberia and Alaska where tidal waves, some kind of huge earth cataclysm, had just wiped out these giant herds of animals who were running around in northern Alaska where there was no ice and had some different temperature and uh, destroyed them all. And even today, people, they just, they find giant piles of, of huge mammoth tusks and things. Um, so trying to figure out all this stuff, who, who man is and how old he was, we have to bring it back, in my mind, to 20, 30, 50, 100,000 years in the past. And people who looked just like us, who were taller and had bigger brains, were running around. I mean, they had all the, the capabilities that we have of intelligence and adventure and inventiveness, of, of using tools. Uh, and, and, in fact, they were actually stronger and bigger than we are. Yet... According to uh, anthropologists, these guys didn't do anything. I mean, for 100,000 years, they, what it, they sat in their caves and uh, 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 ate their woolly mammoth uh, kebabs and stuff. Or but mammoth that, stew. That's very good. I understand mammoth stew is really better, especially if you put it on a walk. I guess there were no walks then. Now, seriously speaking here. The thing I always wonder when we try to interpret what happened thousands of years ago, we can't even agree what happened yesterday. You ask five different talking heads on cable news, and you ask them to explain what happened yesterday, and they can't get it right. They have five different versions of the story. So how are we going to know what happened 10,000 years ago? Yeah, sure. Exactly. And it, it's all interpretation. It's... it's Everything you know, history is is his story. It's it's not her story. It's not their story. It's it's his story or it's my story. And history is written by the winners of wars, not by the losers of wars. And 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 so much of uh, archaeology is just interpretation. You have to start with some kind of basic foundation and idea and. Unfortunately, archaeologists often start with entirely the wrong concept right at the very beginning. And, and that concept is that uh, ancient people didn't do anything. They didn't go anywhere. They didn't have any tools. They had very little knowledge of what they were doing. And yet, they went to remote islands like Namadol. Uh, the island is called Ponte, actually. And uh, they just, uh, for no real good reason, just stacked up 250 million tons of basalt into 100 artificial islands and 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 huge walls 30 feet high with with basalt boulders that are uh, 40 or 50 tons in them. And it, there's not a good explanation for it and, and how it would even be done. And then in all of these sites, there's the why, the why and the how. Why would you go to, and, and again, you're supposedly some primitive uh, person with a, you know, carrying your um, your spear and, and, and uh, your bow and arrow or something with you, and then you just they suddenly decide, oh, I'm going to build this giant building and uh, structure, and uh, I'll, I'll take giant blocks of granite or basalt or whatever, and I'll... I'll haul them here and cut them up and uh, articulate them in all these fancy ways. And 
uh, and then I'll make these giant pyramids and, and huge walls and things like that. And and then people are standing there. I mean, even today, modern tourists are just looking at it with wonder, going like, wow, how did they do that? David, I want to ask you more about this in our next segment. And that is, you know, the common theory here that you take a bunch of primitive people and you say, let's build this structure. It's going to take maybe 100 years. That's okay. We'll go through several generations of people, each one dedicated to the task of building the structure perfectly. It doesn't happen in one year. It's not 10 years. It's 100 years, maybe. And I just wonder the logic about that. How do you discipline people to do that over successive generations? It doesn't make sense to me. David Hatcher Childress is here trying to make sense of all these archaeological mysteries with Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. Do you need a website? Well, you can get a great deal on hosting services with Namecheap's legendary coupon code. They're offering substantial hosting discounts on shared hosting, business hosting, VPS hosting, reseller hosting, and even dedicated servers. Namecheap is preferred by millions. It's backed by a money-back guarantee. Use the coupon code LEGENDARY to cash in on the special deal at Namecheap.com, Namecheap.com. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there is the coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and the coming of the Protectors. Find out more at Rockoids.com. That's Rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. On the average, Americans work between 45 to 50 years hoping to build up enough wealth to retire and live out their golden years. Unfortunately, with taxation, the rising cost of food, energy, housing, and medical, many retirees are forced to live below the poverty line. Is this a flaw free enterprise, or is our monetary unit we call the Federal Reserve Note forcing us into perpetual debt, ensuring inflation and higher taxes? These questions and more can be answered by reading G. Edward Griffin's book, The Creature from Jekyll Island. Congressman Ron Paul states it's what every American needs to know about central bank power. A gripping adventure into the secret world of international banking cartel. Hi, this is Ted Anderson. I will give a silver dollar from the early 1900s to anyone who purchases this book. Call 1-800-686-2237 and order a copy today. It's critical that the public be made aware of the system. Call and order your copy today at 1-800-686-2237. That's 1-800-686-2237. What good is a Big Berkey water filter? We get that question a lot here at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. And in a word, the answer is protection. Protection from water main breaks, E. coli contamination, environmental chemical spills, pesticide runoff, chlorine taste and smell, and all forms of fluoride. Plus, Big Berkey water filters are the original gravity water filter system and most trusted on the market for a reason. Tested by multiple independent NSF EPA certified labs, they are the gold standard in water purification. At only 1.7 cents a gallon, a single set of filters can last for 5 to 10 years. That means big savings. Big Berkey, the one that's powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water. Get a Big Berkey today at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit our website or call 1-877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-BERKEY. Big Berkey Water Filters, for the love of clean water. Extend your life with Extendovite. Here is what one doctor has to say about Extendovite. I would like to thank you, Don, for making my job so much easier because your products just make it so simple, right? To fool around with a lot of exotic things that don't work. We can just put them on your product and things start to work almost right away. I've had dozens and dozens of patients with uh, heart problems who have corrected them. And what it's doing, there's so much garlic in there that has a yeast killing effect. The yeast is a big problem in the gut, pushes the liver heart. It also has metal chelating effect. And most of the other herbs in there I find that strengthen the arteries. They help to neutralize free radicals. Your ram- 
close to what we do in our program as you can get as far as one supplement goes. It's working on the, the gut, it's working on the liver, it's working on the arteries. What more can you ask for? To get your Extendivite, call 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. With Gene and Chris in the Paracast, we'll remind you again to go to plus.theparacast.com. Pay a visit to plus dot the paracast.com that's p-l-u-s dot the paracast.com check out the paracast plus where we offer higher quality audio version of the show with 41 minutes of network ads removed so it goes through everything faster fewer interruptions and also the after the paracast podcast that you can't get any other way for a modest monthly fee plus dot the paracast.com plus dot the paracast.com okay David Hatcher Childress, the question I asked was about how they can possibly be expected to engage in these projects that span generations, all the discipline involved, and if they're trying to just survive, how could they get these people to do such things? Yeah, my point is, is, is why would they do it? I mean, in many cases, you're looking at something that would, would seem to be very difficult, even with heavy machinery and, and cranes and um, all the construction equipment that we have today, many of these structures, uh, especially like ones in Egypt, you see the Great Pyramid and stuff, I mean, they are daunting construction tasks. Uh, and you have to wonder, why would they even try and do this? And here's the, here's the part that, that archaeologists don't really ever ask themselves. Why would they do something which would seem to be done in the most difficult way? They don't have to do things in that way. Building again out of bricks would, and smaller stones would, would seem, that's how we would do it today. Uh, we pour also liquid um, stone and concrete, that's, uh, and that is a smart way to go. But it would seem that these ancient people are doing things not just in a in a kind of large scope, like you're saying, over a hundred years and uh, all the discipline of the workers and stuff, but they're doing it they're doing it in a way that they don't have to it and it would seem like they're doing it in a very, very hard way, moving uh, supposedly with brute force huge, huge stones they don't have to do that uh why aren't they cutting these stones into much more smaller and manageable pieces to work with? Uh, that's what we would do today, but they didn't do that in ancient times. And my point is that it would seem to be that what they were doing wasn't so difficult. Uh, we see it as so hard. I mean, it, man, they're they're dragging these thousand ton blocks around. You know, man, that, how could how could they even do it? Well, well, what are you suggesting that there's some form of lost technology that was being utilized? That, that's well, that, a, yeah, exactly. That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's what I'm saying. They had to have. In my mind, some kind of, of levitation, some anti gravity. It's not these thousands of people hauling some giant block, you know, with with all their ropes and stuff. It, which, which is how we imagine it. It's got to be somehow. It was not so hard for them. Um, it wasn't a thousand people dragging these blocks around. It was more like a, um, half a dozen of them with certain high-tech devices, uh, whether it's some kind of sound technique that, that, that makes blocks of stone weightless. I mean, I don't know exactly, I, although I've always been interested in that. And uh, Adventures Unlimited, we do publish books on anti-gravity and uh, Tesla technology, special death rays, uh, levitation techniques, UFO propulsion, all that kind of stuff. To me, there's, there's, there's totally something to that. NASA has published papers on acoustic levitation of sound. There is supposedly film footage taken uh, in the early 40s by a Swedish uh, aircraft engineer who was in Tibet, and he supposedly 
in, in a book he wrote, um, which which was never in, in English, uh, but but is known to people. And then um, I did discuss it in some of my books. He witnessed, he claimed, uh, Tibetans, Tibetan monks using horns and drums, uh, levitating blocks of stone up on top of a cliff to the building of a monastery. You're kind of hedging and, your bets there, my friend, when you say supposedly and everything. What's your opinion? Well, I, I think that uh, I think it is real. I'm. When I say, yeah, the, the the question is that he supposedly took like 16 millimeter movie film of this, and he writes about it in in his book, which was published in Sweden. But that movie film has never been released, and so it, in that way, it's if the story's true, then it, it's it's suppressed. And so here we have suppressed um, footage that that shows monks levitating and doing things that we would think are impossible. What, I, and things like that are, uh, there's something that I'm, and that's maybe a whole other discussion, but the whole thing of archaeological suppression, uh, evidence that uh, of certain amazing things that allegedly is there, like the Smithsonian suppressing things. I was shown a film uh, in, in Holland that was taken in the early 50s. And it's a Dutch guy, and the, the, who, and he, he had appeared in, and had been in like Ripley's Believe It or Not. He's, he's not well known, um, and I had never heard of him before. The film I was shown, and it was about a half hour film that was silent. It was taken in in Switzerland in the early 50s. But this guy, and he's a he's a thin. Uh, it was a Dutch guy who claimed he had all these yogic secrets and stuff. It's in a laboratory setting. And he's standing there uh, without a shirt and just these pants on. And then these people in Switzerland, uh, they run him through with swords. And his swords are put through his chest and his stomach, completely through, several of them. And, I mean, it's astonishing to watch. And he does not bleed. He does not... um, uh, he's not. He's in no pain or anything. Uh, he stands there. They remove the swords from him, and uh, he's not bleeding. The and although you can see where the sword went in and out, and I mean it's a modern medical miracle. I mean you can't believe it when you're watching this, and and I've seen it a couple of times. Um, and in our Dutch affiliate in, in Amsterdam uh, does sells a book about this guy, and uh, they can get a video of this too. So, so what I'm saying is, yeah, I've seen this movie, and I even today I'm I don't talk about it much, but it it it's mind blowing. I mean, you can't believe it's real, uh, and yet it it has to be. I mean, you're either it's an elaborate fake from the early fifties. Or it's or it's it's a real thing, and and no one can explain it. Now they're not levitating any stones or anything like this in the movie, but this guy is doing things that would seem to be completely impossible. The movie does exist, yet it's not being shown on National Geographic. Uh, most people will probably never ever see this this movie, yet you know it's it's real, and hundreds thousands of people have watched it in Holland. I can tell you. Let's go into more details and a lot more mysteries to ponder in ancient times. We have David Hatcher Childress. And of course, his company is Adventures Unlimited Press. And of course, Chris has written books for them. A lot of our other guests have. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. The nation's largest independently owned and operated talk radio network. The Genesis Communications Network. GCN. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many 
formats I can't even list them. Download now to see if Graphic Converter is good for you, like one and a half million other users. Guess what? You could save money when you buy Graphic Converter. Use the coupon code Night Owl. Use the coupon code Night Owl to get a special price for Graphic Converter. Go to LemkeSoft.com. That's L E M K E Soft.com. LemkeSoft.com. L E M K E Soft.com. Attention listeners, SurvivalLife.com is giving away free Everstrike permanent matches for a limited time only. These matches are waterproof and will light in any weather condition, rain, snow, or sleet. It will still throw a spark. Its built-in ferro rod strikes at 3,000 degrees, and it is good for 15,000 strikes. Normally, $15. Today, it's free. Get yours at FreeWaterproofMatch.com. Again, that's FreeWaterproofMatch.com. Hurry, supplies are limited. Visit FreeWaterproofMatch.com today. It's no secret that government and big business buy in bulk and get huge discounts not available to the little guy. Until now. Introducing a breakthrough crowd buying website where people can join together, buy in bulk, and get massive discounts on millions of popular products. It's TogetherSave.com. TogetherSave.com. You can save 20, 30, or even 50% off tablets, smartphones, cars, appliances, textbooks, sports equipment, video games, and much more. All with free delivery. Check it out. TogetherSave.com. Visit now and start group buying today at TogetherSave.com. The freeze-dry guy, leader in the preparedness industry for 44 years, is closing his California warehouse. Don't miss out on this huge warehouse sale and receive discounts from 30 to 40% off on the finest mountain house and pack away brand freeze-dried and dehydrated foods for long-term food storage or even everyday use. Plus deep discounts on all in-stock survival gear. The freeze-dry guy is offering a wide selection of freeze-dried foods in number 10 cans and even individually packaged entrees. Remember, meats, vegetables, fruits, and long-range patrol rations are the main components for any long-term food storage. This is limited to stock on hand, so hurry and call 866-404-3663 or 530-798-4414. Remember, as always, free shipping to the lower 48 states. So hurry up and call 866-404-3663 or 530-798-4414. Remember, this is limited to stock on hand. The freeze-dry guy is your choice for survival food in an uncertain world. The Genesis Communications Network is one of America's premier broadcasters of captivating talk radio. We thank you for listening. Now, Now, just imagine, there are thousands of people who are just as passionate about radio as you are. But what you may not realize is how easy and affordable it is to advertise with us. Radio commercials for your business could be heard on hundreds of radio stations across the U.S. every day. We can help you by creating an effective radio advertising campaign for your company. From script writing to producing your commercials. Just like the one you're listening to right now. No other network provides the level of customer service we do. When it comes to radio advertising, we are your one-stop shop. And no matter how big or small your business is, we can help. Email us and advertise at GCNlive.com. And an experienced advertising executive will help you take the first step towards driving more customers to your business or website. Advertise at GCNlive.com. Easy, affordable, effective. My name is Richard Dolan. You're listening to the Paracast. With Gene and Chris, we have the second half of our episode with David Hatcher Childress, exploring ancient mysteries, the meaning of those ancient mysteries, and how they might reflect what we know now. And is it possible that maybe ancient aliens weren't here, but an advanced civilization on Earth that for some reason was destroyed in some worldwide catastrophe. So let's look at that. Maybe there's an Atlantis, a Lemuria, some advanced civilization existing thousands and thousands of years ago, David. What would have happened? Would they have simply gone to space and left us alone? Did something here, a change of climate conditions, cause them to leave or destroy their civilization? What? Well, I think there's been a number of civilizations here on Earth, and they're destroyed through through wars or natural cataclysms, calamities. Um, that's the story of Atlantis that it was destroyed in in some. Although there there are two different versions of Atlantis that, that destroyed themselves uh, through some war or whatever, and 
or that they were destroyed in, in a, some cataclysm of the earth. And that's part of the whole archaeological enigma is, is the geological convulsions that that occur occasionally. And we're, we've published a number of books along those lines about pole shifts, cataclysms of the earth. Um, of course, coming up to 2012, there was all these stories of, of some kind of pole shift and, and cataclysm that somehow the Mayans knew about and had ended their decided to end their calendar with some big, giant cataclysm disaster, which, which didn't come, and that's fine. But it, the evidence is there that every few thousand years, every 10,000 years or whatever, the Earth goes through big hiccups. You have what's called a, allegedly a pole shift, where the, the thin crust of the Earth actually moves on the inner core and areas that are the the North Pole or the South Pole slide uh, as much as 180 degrees, maybe, right. and that they even areas that were the pole were are now like at the equator. Right, that, and that would explain, uh, for instance, the the instantaneous die-offs of uh, megafauna and uh, mastodons found uh, with with plant matter in their mouths, like they were literally flash uh, frozen in an instant. Right, exactly, and uh, and that's why there would be glaciers in Illinois and Wisconsin, but not glaciers up in uh, Baffin Island or or Alaska yeah, at that time, because the North Pole was in a different place. Can't you all just uh, determine uh, the exact, uh, at least the location of the magnetic uh, poles at any particular given time in history? I think there's there's been supposedly what sixty five or sixty six. Uh, uh, demonstrated um, examples of a magnetic pole shift, but what you're talking about is, is crustal displacement. Yeah, uh, that's yeah, right. Yeah, crustal. You, yeah, and the, can't you determine that uh, scientifically? And, and if so, uh, why do, doesn't uh, you know? Well, you know, I mean, uh, again, it's it's like what we're talking about with the the experts, and the, the experts can't agree on things. So, and a lot of times, the experts aren't really the experts anyway. They're out of their their field. Today, we have so much talk of, of global warming and uh, we're responsible for some kind of uh, slow warming of the earth and uh, sea levels are going to rise and things like that. And, and, and that's all fine. There's, and I think it's, it's hard to dispute that factories and, and mankind are having some effect on, on weather and, and that the earth is, is warming a little bit. You'd be surprised. But, but it so. doesn't. <laughs> There's quite a few people on our forums that that uh, this has been one of the most contentious debates that we've ever had. Well, and, I'm, and it is. And, 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 and look, there's a lot of stuff to global warming and climate change that are never mentioned. And that's kind of my point uh, is that, well, so-called experts are, are talking about how we're causing ocean levels to rise and we're causing this global warming, yet – there were, you know, global warming and cooling and, and weather change and, and climate change, it's been going on for 100,000 years, and it is severe. Droughts come and go, huge. They think the Mayans were wiped out uh, the, through some, because of a extended drought that, that occurred. There were times in the, just about like a 1,000 years ago when the ice above Canada was, was minimal, and allegedly Vikings and other people could make that nor northern passage very easily. But now there's, there's a lot of ice that appears. But so what caused all that? I mean, is mankind the cause of, of all climatic change? Certainly not. I mean, it, it couldn't be. And in fact, climate change is, you know, it's severe in the past. And to ascribe it all to mankind is, is crazy. And so that's what I'm, you know, while... Well, we might say that, yeah, there, uh, over time, there is some man-made climate change and, and global warming. But on the larger scheme of things, it can't be – it's it's nothing compared to what Mother Nature does and the kind of climate change that Mother Nature is, is able to create, uh, whether it's an El Nino thing or uh, – I mean, we can't explain why there is so much ice in Antarctica and where – and why it melts sometimes. Yeah. One of the, well, the, we the Earth published. obviously has some sort of uh, internal uh, thermostat, which uh, heats up when it needs to and and, uh, and cools off when it needs to. I mean, that would well, be right. And, 
And look, all it takes is a few volcanoes in uh, Indonesia and the Philippines or anywhere to go off, and we'll have global cooling on a huge scale. I mean, we won't have to worry about global warming at all. Uh, they called uh, 1816, I think, was called the year without a summer, and it was because these volcanoes in the Philippines had gone off. And uh, that year, the whole Earth cooled, and uh, the, 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 in North America, they hardly even had a summer that year. And, you know, it has nothing to do with mankind or global warming. And so my real point is that you're going to sit there and watch TV, and they're going to show you all this evidence, and these experts will come on and tell you this and tell you that. And, and, and it's what they don't tell you, maybe, that really matters. Like, oh, well, you know, the Earth goes through warming and cooling periods all the time, and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, they don't tell you that part. Uh, so it's all selective, what we do, and it, this goes to everything, in archaeology, to pole shifts. I mean, they've got experts to explain anything. Uh, they, and from conspiracy angle, whether it's the JFK assassination or, or it's some other political assassination or, or even something like 9-11 or whatever, and and buildings like Building Seven at nine and in, that was never hit by an airplane, but it also collapsed. They have to explain all that somehow, and they do. They get experts, and sometimes they'll just take years to do it, but they'll eventually reach release some paper and they'll say, "Yeah, this is how it happened." And Popular Science and all the news guys will jump on it. They'll say, "Yeah, now they've explained this. We have an answer, and uh, everything's." You know, case closed, kind of thing. Well, uh, you're opening up a uh, big can of worms with World Trade Center number seven, there, uh, Mr. Well, right, well, all that kind of stuff, and (laughs) and I'm not trying to uh, drum on any kind of a necessary conspiracy bandwagon either way. But my point is that people can explain anything, and uh, and well, some we're talking about cataclysmic pole shifts and things like that. But yeah, there'll be. Some geologists who will say, yeah, we, you know, there's something to all that. But they'll get their other experts who say, oh, no, that, that never happens. And or Earth, Here's what most geologists want to tell you, and it's what insurance companies would probably rather you believe, and that is that changes in the Earth and the climate and, and geological change is painfully slow. It doesn't happen rapidly uh, with giant earthquakes and, and tsunamis washing over continents. That's not what happens, no. Earth changes are slow, and, and uh, you know, occasionally a volcano goes off. Yeah, occasionally kind and earthquake. gentle change. Yeah, you know, and uh, we don't have to really worry about it. And, and, in fact, what we really have to worry about is over hundreds of years, the, earth, the ocean levels are going to rise, and some little atolls are going to, you know, be underwater or something like that. Let's have uh, a kind and gentle break. <laughs> David Hatcher, Childress, is here with Gene and Chris. You're in The Paracast. Great minds think alike. The network for the independent minded. The Genesis Communications Network. GCN. First came Attack of the Rockoids, and it was a critically acclaimed success. And now there's The Coming of the Protectors. A former military intelligence man is contacted by a space woman in a dream. A dream that turns out to be a nightmare, because evil forces on our distant planet are planning to conquer the Earth. This is gripping science fiction of the classic kind. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Find out more at rockoids.com. That's rockoids, R-O-C-K-O-I-D-S, dot com. So here's what happened. I was placing an order online. The site went down. It took hours before it returned, but I'd already placed the order with another company. If your site goes down, you could lose business. And if you have a business or personal site, you'll want to know it's easy to run and it will stay online. At iWeb, your site is hosted on one of the most reliable networks in the world. Talk to a sales rep at iWeb.com. Use the promo code TechNightOwl for a special discount. As the new world order continues to tighten its grip on every facet of our lives, we're all asking ourselves, how can we maintain our independence? The answer is clear. Get prepared and you get prepared now. Now the only question left is where do we begin? My Patriot Supply is here to help. Call 800-247-3070 to get started with your 72-hour emergency food supply for only $10. We're even covering the cost of shipping. 
Are you willing to rely on the government and FEMA in the event of an emergency? Call 800-274-3070 to get started with your 72-hour emergency food supply for only $10. You won't be able to find this deal online, and there is a strict limit of four per caller, so don't wait. Call now, 800-274-3070. That's 800-274-3070. Call right now. Ouch! My back is out again! Hi, Dr. Ortman with Wellspring Spinal Care. If you're experiencing neck, mid, or lower back pain, this information is for you. One of the complaints that I hear is patients receive their typical adjustment, only having to repeat them as the pain returns. Putting the bones back in place is only half of the battle. At Wellspring Spinal Care, we have the entire solution. We use the NUCA approach, utilizing three-dimensional x-rays and gentle touch technology to deliver specific correction. We then design Design a custom nutritional supplement program which provides essential nutrients targeting the areas of concern. With a NUCA approach and proper nutrition, you'll be on your way to a faster and more permanent recovery. To get you on the road to wellness, visit DrOrtman.com. That's Dr. O-R-T-M-A-N.com. Or call us today, 952-303-9124. That's 952-303-9124. Wellspring Spinal Care, chiropractic done right. We all know that Berkey Water Purification Systems are the most trusted name in water filtration. As an authorized Berkey dealer for over six years and serving thousands of satisfied customers, the Berkey Guy offers amazing specials for Berkey Water Filtration Systems. The Berkey Light Systems include a set of self-sterilizing and recleanable black purification elements that purify water by removing chlorine, pathogenic bacteria, cysts and parasites to non-detectable levels and remove harmful chemicals such as herbicides and pesticides. Order the Berkey Light Systems system today complete with two black Berkey elements for only $231 and the Berkey guy will ship your order free of charge. With the purchase of a Berkey light, the Berkey guy is also offering a set of fluoride and arsenic filters for only $39.99. That's over 30% off the retail price. Call the Berkey guy at 1-877-886-3653. That's 1-877-886-3653 or order online at goberkey.com. That's goberkey.com today. This is Micah Hanks of the Gray Alien Report, and you're listening to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. We have David Hatcher Childress here this week talking about ancient mysteries, climate change, which of course is very contentious, as you can see. And I don't know if we can pursue that much further. Chris, there were a lot of questions in our forums, and Maybe we should get to some of them. But I want to ask you one thing, which is also contentious, and that is there occasionally get criticisms on some of those books that maybe the editing could be tighter, the grammar and spelling. So what do you have to say about that? Well, I'm sure they could be. Yeah, when I read other books, you know, I notice grammar and spelling and typos and things. So, you know, I always think that, you know, you could improve on probably just about anything you do in my mind. No matter what you do with as a book publisher, errors are going to get in there. Yeah, I think so. And um, I, mean, I read all kinds of books from mainstream publishers, and and books that you know have been you know heavily edited, and and editors have been paid a lot of money to edit them, and then you still see mistakes and typos in them. I, because I'm a publisher, I I I notice them and pick them out. And it's always a little satisfying when you see some, you know, Simon & Schuster book that's got typos or something in it. So, uh, but those guys, you know, major publishers, and it's more and more difficult to be a publisher these days, I think. Uh, major publishers are uh, going under. They're difficult to make money. Bookstores are fewer and far between. And paying editors and uh, other people to, you know, take two years to bring a book out Books will always be around for sure, and there will be bestsellers and blockbusters and, and major publishers. But the whole publishing industry is changing, and more and more uh, we're seeing really self-published books and e-books and things like that. Um, I think there's actually, it's like magazines too, there's actually more magazines and things. And it's to me it's great. Everybody 
uh, can suddenly be a publisher. Was twenty years ago, it was you couldn't really publish your own book or something like that very easily and, and get it out there. But today you can, and I, in my mind, that's a good thing. But do you think, in general, with the disappearance of so many print versions of magazines, for example, that maybe to some degree print is dead? Or is it always true we need printed books, even Captain Kirk in the movie Star Trek to Wrath of Khan? He's given a copy of a book from the 19th century as a birthday present by Dr. McCoy. And you think, how quaint. They don't have <laughs> books in the 23rd century, but they're still treasured. Well, right. And I, you know, I think that the print books will always be um, people, and I know I'm one of them. I, I buy my books as I want an actual printed copy and uh, don't really like carrying around a, a Kindle or a little yeah, pad. To I'll get a read, Kindle but, when, when I can hear the, the page turn and a little uh, scent uh, you know, mechanism shoots out a little puff of newsprint. Uh, yeah, I like to put little post-it notes on pages, too, so it's hard to do that on your computer. So, I, I would like to get to some of our questions, David. Of course, uh, you are controversial, um, having uh, been for now uh, quite a number of years being one of the most visible people on the Ancient Aliens program. There's a number of questions about Ancient Aliens, and, and one of them comes from our uh, listener, Chris Johnson, who's been a... Uh, forum member now for a couple of years. He doesn't post very often, but you brought him out of the uh, out of the lurking closet here. And he's wondering what your favorite episodes of Ancient Aliens are and why. And if you had to recommend one episode of the series to a skeptic to make the case for Ancient Aliens, which one would it be? <laughs> well, I suppose my two favorite episodes are, are really the one where um, uh, they go to Chupumapunku, in Tiwanaku in, in Bolivia, and, and, and I'm in that episode. And also uh, another one where uh, they go to Karnak in, in France, and I'm in that episode too. Both of those episodes are pretty good, I think, and, and good for skeptics to look at because you, you can really see uh, in both those, I mean, you're seeing the giant stone structures, um, at Pumapunku and Tiwanaku, the stones are very um, well articulated and cut. Uh, and of course, in the episode, we're speculating that they're using power tools and and even that they're using like CAD programs to create these H blocks and things like that. And that's all, you know, I mean, in, in that episode and the Karnak episode too, what you see is what you get. I mean, we're we're you're standing there. You're you're looking at the things. Or of course, we're talking about it and showing the anomalies. But and in the case of Karnak, we have all these giant stones, rows of them. And at, with Karnak, mainstream archaeologists, I mean, they have no explanation. Um, and we talk about it in that episode. There's they have there's they have no explanation at all. They can't explain it. They don't know why anyone would have done this. They don't know what it's for. They don't know who did it. Uh, I mean, there's literally thousands of, of manhurs, blocks of stone that are, I mean, yeah, they're, they're, they're weighing 100 tons, even 200 tons. And why, why they would have done this, put it up, I mean, they've gone through a lot of effort, but but even the mainstream archaeologists, when I was there, I was talking to the French archaeologist of the site, and it was a woman, and I asked her what their explanation was. Anyway, and just right before we started filming the episode, and she said, well, we have none. We have, we don't, you know, we, we cannot explain it. So, anyway, I, to me, those are both good episodes, and what skeptics really, and to me, there's nothing wrong with being a skeptic, what the skeptics do need, to, I think, to focus on when they, when they see some of these episodes is it's just to simply realize that archaeologists don't actually have the answers for all for these things. Some things are just utterly a mystery of the who, the how, the what, then the when of doing things. Um, and the ancient aliens show, or, as, or me and my books or whatever, I mean, 
we're we are trying to offer some kind of explanation. Um, it's not the mainstream one. Where, I mean, but it, but the mainstream in in many cases, I mean, they don't have any explanation at all. Um, in the in the case of Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, their explanation is that it's some cult center, uh, some Andean Indians. Yeah, but why uh, would they? They carve those age blocks, which we would have a hard time doing today. It, it just makes no sense to me. I mean, how do they explain again, why, What's why, the motivation? Would be, and yeah, why are they doing that? I mean, it, 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 just moving and, and putting some big stone in place is difficult enough. But like those age blocks and things, I mean, they're, they're not just, you know, bashing stones together and stacking them up. They're cutting and carving them in very articulate and intricate ways so that they're going to fit together. And what's bizarre is that the mainstream archaeologists are saying, well, they don't have these tools. They're, even though they're making these amazing H-blocks, well, cut and articulated, they're doing it with primitive materials. They're, they're, they've got a stone hammer in their hand to do this. They have some little... Uh, stone chisel or, or perhaps, um, bronze chisel or something like that, that they're doing all this and would have to be slow, tedious work to do all that. And again, what for? I mean, why are they even going through all this effort? They don't, you don't see why they would have to do that. So the mainstream archaeologists, I mean, they're, in my mind, they're, they're just completely missing the point. They see these things as, oh, well, you know, they just wanted this thing. They wanted to attract people. They made a pyramid so that uh, people could come there and, and give them gifts, and the priests could have their flock and all this kind of stuff. But and, and they do a similar thing in Shavin, which is another site in more in central Peru. But it's all just a fancy cult center for some uh, religious ceremonies or something like that. But when you're at Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, one of the things that you see, you have the, the keystone cuts, you have these metal clamps. They know there were metals there. And in fact, metals were part of the buildings. And um, the, the, the keystone cuts were see these double T-shaped cuts, and in some cases, uh, sometimes they're like an hourglass. And then molten metals are poured in there. And those metals are, you'll see them in the museum and, and stuff. And, and that is a technique that's used around the world, and it's an unusual building technique too, but it involves pouring molten metals into what are already positioned megalithic blocks. Let's go into more of these details in our next segment. Maybe they had an ancient version of the Steelworkers Union. With Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. Not just an alternative to the mainstream media. We're the premier independent talk radio network. We are GCN. Are you hungry for delicious, nutritious, rich, and satisfying home-cooked meals? Discover the Vita Clay 4-in-1 Smart Organic Cooker. Unglazed Zisha Clay, an ancient secret that makes this fast multi-cooker so special. Infusing your food with incredible flavors, perfect texture, vitamins, and minerals for your good health. It's a slow cooker, rice cooker, a steamer, plus a yogurt maker. Go to VitaClayChef.com and enter promo code RADIO20 for 20% off at checkout. That's VitaClayChef.com. We the people grow cotton, weave fabric, engrave ink, embed strips and fibers to protect from counterfeit and carding to a private bank, having it led back at interest, forcing tax to service debt. This capitalism, or was Jefferson correct when stating a central bank issuing the public currency is a greater menace to the liberties of the people than a standing army? Hi, Ted Anderson. I'm placing a free silver dollar in a book that explains our monetary system. Call for your copy, 800-686-2237. It's time to understand the system. Call 800-686-2237. That's 800-686-2237. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HDTV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and 
installation. You control what you watch when you watch it. Record your favorite shows, pause and rewind live TV, even skip the commercials. Watch local channels too. At just $19.99, what are you waiting for? Pull out your major credit or debit card. Call 1-855-905-MYTV. 1-855-905-MYTV. Say goodbye to the cable guy. Cut costs and get more. 1-855-905-MYTV. 1-855-905-MYTV. Welcome back to the Paracast, the gold standard of paranormal radio. And now, here's Gene Steinberg. We have David Hatcher Childress joining Gene and Chris. Remember to go to plus.theparacast.com, P L U S. Theparacast.com, where you learn about the Paracast Plus. We give you the exclusive After the Paracast podcast and then teach you how to say that five times fast. We also have a high resolution audio copy of our show with the network ads omitted. More stuff coming, a video channel and everything, plus.theparacast.com. Sign up. And if you order a one year or five year subscription, you get a copy of the ebook version of Stalking the Tricksters Free. We have David Hatcher Childress trying to discuss the construction techniques of the ancients using molten metal. Hmm. They were able to do that? Well, right. Uh, and I mean, that's kind of my point is that these structures, these, these places, specifically in this instance, Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, they're really metallurgical centers. They're, rather than being some cult center and, and religious center that's so fancy with artificial lakes and rivers that are diverted and all kinds of stuff, has huge structures as well. The whole area itself is, in my mind, is it's a metallurgical plant. Uh, they, and, and of course, uh, in that area, there, there are lots of metals. Um, the Andes is, is a great mining area, and Tiwanaku uh, was known to have sheets of gold uh, that were uh, like literally wallpapered some of the walls and stuff like that. So it was really a fabulous gold city of of metals of of bronze, and that is and that's technology right there. So so here you have uh, uh, what is a, a in a sense a giant city, but rather than just being uh, what archaeologists would say, oh yeah, they you know they just wanted a pyramid. So they, people could, you know, priests could, you know, uh, uh, do sun ceremonies, you know, a couple of times a year. But in, but in reality, I mean, they're just missing the whole point, which is this, there, there had to be a huge metallurgic processing plant somewhere to process to, you, you've got to, you've got to wash the ores, then you've got to heat them, you have to have kilns. Uh, there are these towers that are all around Lake Titicaca. Uh, archaeologists say they're burial towers, yet these towers that w- could have easily have been the kilns for uh, the, the, the you, you need charcoal, you, you, you've got literally have to make these uh, super hot furnaces, you then melt the ore, then you, you, you've got to mix alloys together in order to, <laughs> to create bronze and, and whatnot. So, so rather than having just some simple people trying to create a cult center, what you have instead is a Bethlehem Steelworks that's with a foundry, and, and you've got molten metals, you've got raw ores, you've got to have charcoal and kilns, and in the end, you have all of these ironsmiths and goldsmiths bashing out uh, gold plates and, and literally chisels and, and uh, other metal artifacts out of bronze. And they're pouring it into the blocks and using that for that uh, to, to hold the blocks together. So, the evidence yeah, when I go to Tiwanaku, I'm seeing a giant metal foundry, but archaeologists you know, don't see that at all. But, but what happened to all the metal, uh, fab, you know, the fabricated objects, the tools, the, uh, you know, the things that were being created at this, at this complex? I mean, why don't we have any evidence of that? 
Well, there is evidence. And if you go to the museum in, at Tiwanaku, you'll see some of those. But most of them are gone. Uh, I mean, the whole place has been looted. And in fact, uh, essentially, again, if you're just a wandering tribe moving through the Andes and you come across the ruins of this giant city, and, and Tiwanaku is completely, utterly destroyed through some, in my mind, through some cataclysm, earthquakes, and literally a tidal wave from Lake Titicaca that wiped it out. But And so the buildings have, and are huge, have the you know, they've come down. And so because the, some of the walls are destroyed, you'll see some of these metal clamps. But if you're a wandering tribe, you're going to take those metal clamps. You'll pry them out, and then you'll, you'll hammer it into a, into a knife or a sword or a spearhead or something like that. The ones that they find are ones that are buried. And because this tidal wave wiped out Tiwanaku and Pumapunku, much of it's just buried under literally 20 feet of mud and muck. So as they dig that out, they'll then find blocks of stone that have the metal pieces in them, and they're still there. And, and so you will see some in the, in the museum. But, you know, uh, gold metal is, is, is so valuable. And uh, whenever somebody Especially can, to a Stone Age civilization. <laughs> well, that's right. <laughs> Well, okay, let's let's move on here a little bit because we need to get to some of these questions. Um, we do have a couple of questions about your latest book, uh, which was on the Vimanas, which are the ancient aircraft of India. And a couple of people have, have kind of scratching their heads and they're wondering, um, you know, in, in one of your uh, questions here, it says in your work on Vimanas, you draw heavily on the Vimanica Shastra work psychically channeled and written down in post-World War I years. Uh, the question is, what are your reason, reasons for treating it as a generally ancient text, which I'm not sure you do. This is a question from Bonaventure. And then an, another question is, your theories on the, the literal reality of Amanas have been called the fundamentalist reading of material, which was written more so as allegoric myth or the advancement of spiritual understanding, and less so as a, a factual account of warring gods. What are your thoughts on that? And, and the practice of supporting historical theories with religious texts in general. Well, sure. I mean, um, in my mind, religious texts and myths and legends um, up from around the world have some validity. We can't necessarily take them completely literally. And I mean, I, I think it's fair to assume, uh, although many people do take everything in the Bible or the Quran or Bhagavad Gita or Ramayana completely literally. I mean, this is, you know, and that's, that's a scary thought. Yeah. And I, I mean, I certainly don't do that. And, um, but yet I don't completely discount them either. I, to me, there's, I try to find a balance there that, yeah, there's, there's something valid here. Uh, it's an interesting story. Uh, can there be some truth to it? Um, and it's certainly when it comes to say Vimanas, um, with the whole idea, I mean, it's not just uh, Ramayana, the Mahabharata, talking about Vimanas. Um, the Kebra Nagast, which is a Ethiopian sacred book, talks about uh, flying ships and airships and, and the king people flying. Very specific about that. Uh, well, I think actually, Solomon had a flying carpet, didn't he? <laughs> Well, yeah, and King Solomon supposedly yeah flew, um, and and that's also in the Kevin Gast. You have the Ark of the Covenant that we were talking about earlier. It flew, and it, it also caused things to to fly. Uh, the Israelites followed this pillar of fire uh, through the desert. Also, these lights and the, and the Ark itself would lead them and and supposedly fly through the air. You have so we should take all these things literally then. Well, I, I mean, I, I think we, in my mind, I think we can interpret some of these things as, as yeah, that there's something there. When it comes to the Ark of the Covenant, as an example, uh, and it's, it's my new book that I'm working on now, there's something to it. I mean, it's not just, in my mind, it's not just completely, utterly fabricated. There's something there. 
Uh, they had some object. They carried it. Whether it could do all the things that they say it did, I, and in fact, I, I doubt if it could. But it's, you know, I'm not going to just discount it. And in fact, you know, I'm convinced, um, and anyone who reads my books would, would, would know this, that I'm convinced that in ancient times, they had advanced technology, much as we have today. We have David Hatcher Childress. We're talking about ancient mysteries and more with Gene and Chris. You're in the Paracast. <laughs> Neighbors, are you tired of dealing with a slow web hosting provider? Well, check out A2 Hosting and their screaming fast Swift server platform. They even have SSDs that load pages 300% faster than the competition. Ready to give your site a speed boost? Well, tell you what, neighbors, head on over to a2hosting.com. That's A2, that's number two, a2hosting.com. Check out their Prime Hosting account. And get this, neighbors, they're even giving you an exclusive 25% off discount for all our listeners. 25%. And remember, their Guru Crew support team is standing by 24-7, 365 days a year to answer any of your questions. Now, to get the discount, use the coupon code GENE when you check out. Making the right decisions is a challenge to investors. Are we going to see economic growth, slide into a recession, or at worst, depression? Hi, Ted Anderson from Midas Resources. We all know when a company acts irresponsibly, divesting ourselves in a move towards safety is prudent. When the market becomes volatile, U.S. Treasuries are a safe haven. But what do you do when the U.S. government overextends itself and spends beyond its means? Many investors are turning toward gold as a common-sense alternative to traditional paper investments. Midas Resources has put together a powerful book titled 10 Reasons to Own Gold, discussing costs, benefits, risks, featuring full-color illustrations, weights, and measures. The book is free and can be yours by calling 800-686-2237. Paper investments are dwarfed by gold's 6,000-year history. Discover how gold may be right for you and your IRA by calling 800-686-2237. Whether buying or it's time for you to sell, the book is free. Call 800-686-2237. Don't complain about your cable bill going up and up and up. Do something about it. Grab a pencil and jot down this special number. 1-855-905-MY-TV. The more cable TV rates go up, the better digital satellite TV looks. Say goodbye to the cable guy. And get more of your favorite channels in 100% digital quality for less money. Call 1-855-905-MY-TV. Sign up for packages starting as low as $19.99 and there's no equipment to buy. You get free HD TV upgrade, a free DVR upgrade, and free professional and installation you control what you watch when you watch it record your favorite shows pause and rewind live tv even skip the commercials watch local channels too at just 19.99 what are you waiting for pull out your major credit or debit card call 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV say goodbye to the cable guy cut costs and get more 1-855-905-MY-TV 1-855-905-MY-TV most people know that drinking pure high alkaline pH water is the most important factor in maintaining high energy and vibrant health. Most experts agree that the water you drink should be at a pH level of 8 or higher. AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops combine a unique formula of the most alkaline minerals. Using Plasma pH Drops is the best way to make your water alkaline to help you get rid of acid and regain your health and energy. Simply put 10 drops in the water you drink to raise the pH to a healthy level. Alkalizing water helps your body rid itself of acidic waste and increases the oxygen content of your body. Disease organisms like bacteria, viruses, and cancer cannot survive in an alkaline high pH environment. Order your bottle of AlkaVision Plasma pH Drops now by going directly to AlkaVision.com. That's A-L-K-A-Vision.com. Or call 269-409-1776. 269-409-1776 today. We'd like to hear from you. If you have a comment or question about the Paracast, send it to news at theparacast.com. That's news at theparacast.com. And don't forget to visit our famous Paracast community forums at forum.theparacast.com. 
With Gene and Chris, we have David Hatcher Childress, adventurer, man about town. Now, let's, is that true? No, I don't think it's true. Let's continue discussing the ancient mysteries. So the point here, I gather, is that traditional archaeologists, David, are trying to, whether it's done with Swiss cheese logic or anything, find a conventional explanation for everything that people like you report in terms of things that show advanced technologies. They're assuming it can't, so let's twist it around to find ways that it fits. Is that what's happening here? Well, right. And I mean, what I'm maintaining is that things that we have today, and whether the science, the technology, whether it's, it's flight or electricity, whether it's uh, power tools, giant cranes, and, and even, as far as I'm concerned, heavy machinery. We have it today, and there's no reason why in ancient times people couldn't have had those things too. When you look okay, at technology... No in order to have heavy cranes and, and, and large mechanical devices, I mean, there's, there would be at least some evidence of this, and we have absolutely none. We have no evidence uh, of any sort of, uh, you know, high technology uh, from the past. I mean, you know, sure, we have the Baghdad battery and the, uh, you know, the, the Greek, uh, you know, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce it. but The uh, Antikythera device is what you're talking about. Yeah. Antikythera uh, device. All I'm saying is that we don't really have evidence of of large heavy machinery or uh, power, power equipment or anything along those lines. Well, I think we do. I mean, that's that's what my book, Technology of the Gods, and and, and my book on Vermonas is is all about. That. Um, well, we have evidence as far as the results of utilizing that sort of technology, but the actual tools that were used, we don't have have solid physical evidence in in artifacts that uh, that show uh, an exalted high technology. Well, okay, yeah, sure, that's right, and um, we do have. There are certain. There are certain gold artifacts that are are really jewelry, and in fact, I was I was just in Colombia viewing the the famous gold museum where they have these so called famous gold airplanes there, and and they are there, and they have them on display. They're small, and and they're gold. Uh, they're they're pure gold, and and in fact, the, the gold museum in Bogota is it's well it's full of gold, and uh, gold gold is indestructible. All gold from ancient times still exists today. Uh, you cannot destroy gold as an element. I mean, it, it, and that's something special about gold. Other metals and um, and most other elements and materials, except for basalt or so, and, and you know, quartz crystals and things, although they can be crushed and ground. And, and metals particularly will oxidize and and they'll rust. Um, Gold is too soft to really make any kind of meaningful tool out of. Uh, it, it's okay in electrical devices, and it's a good conductor of electricity, and it doesn't corrode. But otherwise, you can't really make saws and uh, chisels and hammers and things like that out, out of gold. You have to make those really out of, ideally, of iron and steel uh, or, say, bronze and things like that. But those, all those metals will corrode and, and rust away. If you took a bulldozer and parked it in your backyard and left it there, over time, of maybe it would take 100 years or something, it'll rust away and it'll literally just turn into a pile of red dust. Um, and that's what would happen to um, an aircraft or any kind of vehicle. I mean... As an example, we don't really we don't really know what Greek ships look like. We don't have very good renditions of and, and pictures of them. There are a few, and we fortunately have some ceramics from ancient Greece. And there is on the island of Rhodes. There's one carved relief of the of a prow of a of a Greek ship. And we know the Greeks had lots of ships. And they yeah. they built huge ships and they sailed all over the Mediterranean and out into the Atlantic and up the Black Sea. I mean they must have had thousands and thousands of ships, but 
they didn't they didn't really depict them in <laughs> nobody uh, bothered their to make artistry and stuff. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, well, how about Greek you know, fire? It, what was Greek fire? Do you think we still don't? <laughs> well, you know. see, yeah, more of and Greek fire is something like that too, where they had this this fire, this chemical mixture, and it would burn underwater. And they would fling it with catapults and stuff onto enemy ships and and uh, would start the ships on fire, and they couldn't put it out. And even uh, – and, and, and we don't know what it was today. We know there are descriptions of it. Uh, in ancient times, too, um, people wanted to keep secrets. And if you read about stories – and I, I – you know, I try and put all this as much as I can into my books on the monas and uh, technology of the gods and whatnot. But ancient people were constantly, they wanted to keep secrets. And with, when they had technological secrets, Greek fire is a good example, even of, of flight and, and building some kind of airship, whether it was, you know, could have been like a Zeppelin or a balloon or whatever. I want to know uh, what Soma was. Well, yeah. <laughs> So in, anyway, ancient people, this, was, this is a problem that we have, too, where uh, certain uh, guilds and, um, you know, you, you were part of a, a Masonic guild or blacksmiths were very much like this. And in fact, people who worked as blacksmiths in, in the Middle Ages had special reputations and people were afraid of them. You could be cursed by blacksmiths and kind of evil eye. And the, there's the expression called a tinker's dam, where and a tinker was also a, a kind of a minor sort of blacksmith who went around fixing people's pots and things like that. But because blacksmiths worked with molten metals and 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 hot fires, and they did they did things that other people couldn't do, and and people had a kind of, had a fear of them. Um, and, and they had secrets. Um, you, you, you can't do what they do. They, they have these, you know, certain talents, uh, that they, that they were taught and, and now they go from town to town and, and they use their talents, but they keep it a secret. So this has gone on throughout ancient times and Throughout history, if you read things, they'll, they'll even explain things. This is in some of the ancient Indian texts, where they'll say, oh, yeah, well, uh, and in China, they would do this. Um, they get some inventor who makes something for the king, and then, he's, then the king has him killed. So he can't go and make it for somebody else. He can't um, profit from his inventions because they didn't have patent laws in those years. I'm being a little silly here, but we're going to do a break now and get more of listener questions and things from David Hatcher Childress, adventurer and archaeologist, man about town who learned in the Orient the incredible secret to cloud men's minds so they cannot see him. Oh, that's the wrong person. That's not David, that's Lamont. We'll talk about that later. With Gene and Chris, you're in the Paracast. <laughs> Free from the shackles of corporate America, we're the place for independent thinkers. GCN. Graphic Converter is the image manipulation tool for the rest of us. It does not use any database. You get full control of all your files. Want to view the images of a folder? Drag it into Graphic Converter and a powerful browser opens up to show your image files. You could use it for slideshows. You could use it to import images from digital cameras or from scanners. Need to do some image editing? You can do that too in Graphic Converter. Also print catalogs. Convert from so many formats i can't even list them download now to see if graphic converter is good for you like one and a half million other users guess what you could save money when you buy graphic converter use the coupon code night owl use the coupon code night owl to get a special price for graphic converter go to lemkesoft.com that's l-e-m-k-e soft.com lemkesoft.com l-e-m-k-e soft.com it's no secret that government and big business buy in bulk and get huge discounts not available to the little guy until now. 
introducing a breakthrough crowd buying website where people can join together, buy in bulk, and get massive discounts on millions of popular products. It's TogetherSave.com. TogetherSave.com. You can save 20, 30, or even 50% off tablets, smartphones, cars, appliances, textbooks, sports equipment, video games, and much more. All with free delivery. Check it out. TogetherSave.com. Visit now and start group buying today at TogetherSave.com. Good people need help. The Homeowners Association said we had weeds and fined us $25. We told them they had the wrong house. They said if we didn't pay it, they'd file a lien. Our attorney demanded photographs, witnesses, and told them if they couldn't provide this, they must cease and desist. Issue solved. Worry less and live more with LSProtection.com. That's LSProtection.com or call 855-340-SAVE. That's 855-340-7283. Results will vary from case to case. What good is a Big Berkey water filter? We get that question a lot here at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. And in a word, the answer is protection. Protection from water main breaks, E. coli contamination, environmental chemical spills, pesticide runoff, chlorine taste and smell, and all forms of fluoride. Plus, Big Berkey water filters are the original gravity water filter system and most trusted on the market for a reason. Tested by multiple independent NSF EPA certified labs, they are the gold standard in water purification. At only 1.7 cents a gallon, a single set of filters can last for 5 to 10 years. That means big savings. Big Berkey, the one that's powerful enough to purify stagnant pond water. Get a Big Berkey today at BigBerkeyWaterFilters.com. GCN listeners receive 5% off all ceramic filter systems. Visit our website or call 1-877-99-BERKEY. That's 877-99-BERKEY. Big Berkey Water Filters, for the love of clean water. Extend your life with Extendovite. Here is what one doctor has to say about Extendovite. I would like to thank you, Don, for making my job so much easier because your products just make it so simple, right? To fool around with a lot of exotic things that don't work. We can just put them on your product and things start to work almost right away. I've had dozens and dozens of patients with uh, heart problems who have corrected them. And what it's doing, there's so much garlic in there that has a yeast killing effect. The yeast is a big problem in the gut, pushes the liver heart. It also has metal chelating effect. And most of the other herbs in there I find that strengthen the arteries. They help to neutralize free radicals. Your remedy close to what we do in our program as you can get as far as one supplement goes. It's working on the the gut, it's working on the liver, it's working on the arteries. What more can you ask for? To get your Extendivite, call 1-877-928-8822 or visit heartdrop.com. Extend your life with Extendivite. Clark, author of the UFO Encyclopedia and other books. You're listening to the Paracast. I know that David Hatcher Childress is going to try to find some ancient Indian curse or something after I said some silly things. If he doesn't, I'll help him. (laughs) Both of you. Okay, here's one. I got a good question for you. What are some of the most exciting discoveries in the fields of archaeology and ufology over the past few years that intrigue you the most? That one comes from our our, uh, poster, Psychedelic Alchemist. So most exciting discoveries in the fields of ufology and archaeology in the past few years. Anything kind of jump out? You know, um, the next issue of our our magazine, World Explorer, has a couple of interesting articles in it, and and one of them is about um, this place in Indonesia called Padang Gurong, or Padang Gunong, and it is this basalt mountain, like Nan Madol, of all these prismatic basalt stacked up on this, this huge mountain. It's I've not been there, um, and I'm wanting to go. I, I only really found out about it uh, about a year or so ago. But they're dating it to around 20,000 BC. It's apparently man-made, and it's intriguing to me because it's like Nam Nadal in uh, the Micronesian island of Penape, where it's what would appear to be millions of tons of basalt. Wow, it's that would be the oldest up. archaeological site on on the planet that we've discovered. It would be. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, this would be 10,000 years older than Gobekli Tepe, say, which is the one they're saying is the oldest at this point. And it's in, I've always been intrigued with Indonesia and kind of Pacific Islands there. 
that is where uh, the banana originated. And, and bananas are kind of a weird thing since we're talking about ancient civilizations and whatnot. Um, bananas are all over the world and are they're mysterious. They're a complete food. Um, they bananas are thought to have originated in northern Australia, New Guinea, uh, the very eastern part of Indonesia. And bananas are a tallest grass. Each any banana plant is only a year old. It makes one bunch of bananas, and it's a seedless fruit. Uh, bananas are one of the few foods that you can completely live on, and it's it's some kind of genetically engineered food from 10 to 20,000 years ago, and it's it's coming out of Indonesia apparently. And it's I mean a banana you cannot plant a banana. There's no seed in a banana. Bananas grasses have to reproduce either by seed or from tubers in, in the ground, and that's how bananas have to reproduce. You cannot plant a banana, but yet bananas are all over the world. They're in remote islands. They're in remote jungle areas of South America. They're in remote jungle areas of Africa. They're on virtually every island in the Pacific and throughout Indonesia and Asia. It's the world's most popular fruit, the banana. Yeah. And it's something we eat every day, practically. Yeah, and, and, and we don't really every know where it comes from. <laughs> yeah, but, but uh, you know, and plant botanists, they can't explain it. In nature, nature does not create a seedless fruit. Um, it's, that has to be genetically engineered. Mm. Sometime, I mean, over 10,000 years ago, it would seem that someone genetically engineered the, perhaps ancient aliens, engineered the banana and then distributed it all over the world. Um, and, well, that, that and was quite magnanimous of them. That was, that was very nice of them to do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, bananas and, and sunflower uh, seeds are the only two things that you can eat only them and survive on, to my knowledge. Is that right? Okay. Yeah, sunflower there's, seeds is another one. There's, a, a, there's a fruit in Peru called the chirimoya fruit, and it's a kind of a little bit like a pear. Supposedly, it too is very nutritious, and you can completely right. as far as plants. Yeah, and it, it has seeds, by the way. There's <laughs> a lot of banana. fat boys out there and college college dudes that uh, think that they plant their bananas all over the place, but. Uh... <laughs> But anyway, I, I like to bring up bananas because there's something so familiar to us. We we consume so many bananas, all of us, and yet we don't realize how mysterious. I mean, it, it, the banana itself is uh, is unexplained. So uh, these things are all around us, and it's it's kind of my point when we were talking about um, bananas or or where's the uh, evidence of any ancient technology or whatever. In many ways, it, it's all around us, but we have to to look at it and and know what we're looking at. And when you just have when you start as the modern archaeologists do with just a basic assumption that's wrong, which is that uh, ancient man is uh, was primitive. They didn't have tools. They didn't go anywhere. They didn't like to travel, um, and and they did everything with with brute force and as simply as they could. And yet, that's just a wrong assumption, and so, in my mind. So basically, your supposition here is, let's find out how they did it, rather than assume they must have done it in some very primitive way. Well, right. And in a way, what I'm also saying is, finding, finding the right expert to explain things is also what's important. And... In Egypt is a good example. Uh, when you go and you see the giant structures there, starting with the Great Pyramid, but there's plenty of stuff in Egypt. There's just so much, including the obelisks and everything. And but when you're an Egyptologist and you you've got your PhD from various universities and you've learned uh, who all the pharaohs are and and the dynasties, and you've even learned how to read some hieroglyphs and all that kind of stuff. But the thing that you're not an expert on is engineering and architecture. And, um, you know, you, 
you haven't gone to school to learn how to build giant buildings and from an engineer's perspective you haven't you haven't gone to school to to you know to figure out how the Lincoln Memorial is going to be quarried and moved and built that's not something that you've learned so you're not an expert you're an Egyptologist you're an expert on the the pharaohs of Egypt but you're not an expert on quarrying buildings moving giant blocks and then, you know, what it would take to run a construction crew and build, say, the Great Pyramid. I mean, you don't know what you're talking about. But, but, and this is the problem. When you talk to Egyptologists, they don't, they think they do know what they're talking about. They think they're engineers. They think that uh, they're architects. And they'll say, oh, well, you know, the Pharaoh just ordered uh, his guys to drag all these blocks up here and build a giant tomb for him, you know? It's that simple. I mean, that's what they'll say. And but now, but they don't say, oh, well, here, let's ask this engineer over here from the University of Cairo what he thinks. No, they don't say that. And that engineer from the University of Cairo, he's not going to say he's not. He'll be nonplus. He'll he will say, I can't, I can't tell you how they did this. I don't know. Um, you know, I can't explain it. Uh, and I'm an engineer, but I don't know. You know, I don't, I can't read hieroglyphs, and I don't know who the pharaohs are. But I can tell you that. I don't know how they could have made this thing. So this is the problem, is that uh, a lot of the experts aren't, they're not experts. And they won't go to the people who are the experts, because those people will give them answers and questions that they don't want to hear, such as, uh, we can't explain this. We don't know how they would do it. So this, You're saying it's you know, kind of like, is, like, like going to a soccer goalie and asking them how to throw a, a major league fastball. Well, and it's, you know, <laughs> you're, you're smart. Sense. <laughs> you're you're actually a smarter person if you realize you don't know very much. Yeah. When you think you know all kinds of things that you don't actually know, you're you're showing you're, your you're dumb really because yeah you you don't realize that you're you're stupid and you don't know all these things. Well, you, you have a bigger uh, scope than your your knowledge base. Well, let's move on real quick here. I got a question from Oakenwolf. Uh, we have been been posting questions uh, to our, our, our guests from him from time to time, and he's come out of the woodwork for this one. Uh, it's been a while since we've seen him. But one site that's always interested him, uh, and he has yet to visit it, is American Stonehenge. He's wondering who really built it and for what reason, and also any thoughts that the Celtic Druids and could possibly have come over to America at any point. With David Hatcher Childress and Gene and Chris, you're in The Paracast. <laughs> Not just an alternative to the mainstream media. We're the premier independent talk radio network. We are GCN. Attack of the Rockoids has been well received by critics and readers alike. It's a thrill a minute story you'll never forget. A former U.S. military intelligence officer is haunted by intense dreams about a beautiful woman pleading for his help after a terrible battle in outer space. But the dreams turn out to be true and thrust him into a telepathic love affair with a woman whose faraway planet is intent on destroying the Earth. And now the gripping tale continues in The Coming of the Protectors. It's the second book of the Rockoids trilogy, a galaxy-spanning adventure that pits our hapless heroes against powerful, fanatical enemies that threaten the lives of freedom-loving beings everywhere. Attack of the Rockoids and The Coming of the Protectors. Classic science fiction at its best. Available now. For more details, visit rockoids.com. That's R O C K O I D S dot com. By now, you may have heard a bit about Bitcoins. But did you know Bitcoins are now over an $8.5 billion market? And did you know that over 65,000 businesses now accept Bitcoins? Listen, if you're already earning Bitcoins or trying to make money in the Bitcoin market, you've got to know BidBit.co. Why? Because BidBit.co is where you can easily receive Bitcoins by selling and auctioning off your own personal items or promote business products and services for Bitcoins. You heard right. Whether personal or business, you can now buy, sell, and 
auction your products and services quickly, easily, and securely for Bitcoin at BidBit.co, the first and only marketplace website to offer BidBit escrow, a proprietary technology which gives buyers and sellers security and peace of mind because all transactions are protected. Start today. It's free to join, free to post, free to auction, and free to bid at BidBit.co. Buy, sell, bid, or auction everything Bitcoin. That's www.bidbit.co. BidBit.co. Hi, this is Steve Sanchez, and based on a recent study, it was found that 57 million Americans had legal issues over the last 12 months, but only 60% of those studied sought out the services of a lawyer. Why? In a nutshell, affordability. While well, my friends at Legal Shield have created a solution that can help you not if, but when you need an attorney. For as little as $17 per month, Legal Shield will provide you unlimited access to qualified attorneys at an accomplished law firm for advice and counsel on legal issues, no matter how serious or trivial. For over 40 years and with 1.4 million families across North America, Legal Shield can help you, the loyal GCN listener. Representatives are standing by now to answer your questions, so call them now at 1-855-340-SAVE. That's 1-855-340-7283 or visit them at lsprotection.com. That's lsprotection.com. Results will vary from case to case. I'm Kay Swirling from KSCO Radio in Santa Cruz. I'm 93 years old, and I'm a big fan of Alex Jones because he has the courage to speak his mind more than just about anyone I know. Alex is just as bothered as I am about all the advertising you hear for toxic prescription drugs that make you sicker, not healthy. I prefer to give my body all 90 essential nutrients it needs for life to prevent prevent disease, not compound it. My favorite complete supplement is Beyond Tangy Tangerine from Longevity, which I take every day along with EFA Plus and Beyond Osteo FX. I recommend you go online to InfoWarsTeam.com to purchase these products and make them part of your daily regimen to get healthy and live longer. InfoWarsTeam.com Hi, this is Nick Pope. You're listening to the Paracast. We have David Hatcher Childress with Gene and Chris in the Paracast, our final segment. Chris? Well, before we went to break, I was wondering about uh, American Stonehenge, and Oakenwolf is interested in your take on what it is. I, I'm not familiar with this uh, with this particular site. Uh, do you want to give us a little description of it and then give us your thinking about it? Yeah, I've been there um, a couple of times. It's... It's in New Hampshire. It's not too far from from Boston, really, and uh, it is a more or less a megalithic site. It has stone chambers and uh, some standing stones, and even dolmens and things like that. It's, I would say, yeah, it is uh, similar to uh, the, the kind of Celtic or whatever Druid do- monuments that you find in in England and, and Western Europe and stuff, and, and probably was built in my mind, by that ancient Celt or who, whoever. I, I, I don't know who built it. It's also one of these sites where mainstream archaeologists, they refuse to really look at it. The guy, the owner of the site, told me back in the, back in the 90s how they had invited uh, archaeologists from, from Harvard and Yale and University of Massachusetts and stuff to come and look at it and, and examine the site, and they refused. They simply wouldn't look at it, <laughs> uh, and you know. So why doesn't that surprise me? Yeah, uh, and and so they just say it's the work of an eccentric farmer. Um, uh, you know, it's not some ancient megalithic site. Some farmer in the well, is it lined up astronomically, like the world, like the the Wilshire Stonehenge? I mean, does it have, you know, like does on the winter solstice does the sun shine all the way down to the back of the wall or something like that? Or well, yeah, yeah, stuff like that goes on there and this standing stone supposedly lines up with uh, winter solstice or and the equinoxes or something like that. So yeah, um, there probably is some archaeo astronomy thing there, I would think. And uh, people have done, and then certainly the owners of the site is privately owned, and they have a, a bookstore there, and it's a fun place to go. Um, 
But again, the mainstream archaeologists, I mean, they won't, they won't even look at it, according to him. I mean, they just refuse to, to even consider this. So you have... Isn't that intellectually things, dishonest? Well, and a lot of it is, it's kind of what we were talking about earlier about history and how history is, is his story. It's not her story or their story. And today, history is engineered by controlling the past and what we think of the past and, and, and in a sense, who we are and where we've been and where, where we're coming from. By controlling all that, we're, we can kind of control the future, in a sense. One of the things that's been going on, uh, in my mind, in the last 100 years or something, is that history's been made uh, politically correct. And it's kind of a problem where, yeah, all these bad things didn't really happen in, in history, um, particularly what was going on, say, with Native Americans originally, and uh, apparently North America, uh, particularly the area of the United States, was completely depopulated by wars around 1200 A.D. And there's evidence that really Siberian tribes, um, what they call Dine, uh, Dine and Nadine speakers, swept, and they and they were Siberians, really. They coming from over this, they they came through Alaska and down through Canada. And into the Midwest of America, where the mound builder sites were, and the Cahokia and, and these places, and they basically sieged all these towns and killed everybody and ate them. They ate and the then mates. they moved in. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah, they were cannibals, too. And they, uh, and they were very they were warlike tribes. And, they, and then they moved into the Southwest, and basically the Apache Indians. And, I mean, they, they're the Siberian speakers. And they, and you know, they didn't come ten thousand years ago across the Bering oh, Strait. Yeah, they, they, they came around twelve hundred A.D. Khan. Yeah, they're like total newcomers to, to the Americas, and they had their uh, teepees. Uh, and in fact, in Siberia and Mongolia and stuff, people have exactly the the teepees and the travois, oh, the those little carriers. I mean, everything that we associate with North American Indians and their lifestyle is how the Siberians. And people still live today. The yurts and tents, this is how they lived. But so as a result, North America, really, at the time of European expansion into, into the Americas, North America had been completely decimated. And, the, and the, the tribes living there lived in basically in the Stone Age. Even though in ancient, older times, they had metals. They had all this copper from the Michigan, uh, Lake, Lake Superior and northern Michigan. And there are tons and tons of copper, pure copper, came out of there. And in fact, they don't, archaeologists don't know where it went, all that copper. There was so much metal. And in Europe at that time, they, were, they actually had the Copper Age. And everybody had copper and was running around.